that. Uh, John chapter number 1, now for this morning's message, John chapter 1, and uh, we want to pick up reading here in verse 29. John chapter number 1, and we're going to verse 29. The next day, John uh, the Baptist seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's what John said when he saw Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is uh, preferred before me, for he was before me. And that speaks clearly to the eternality of our Savior. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now you'll remember from Malachi, John was to be the forerunner of the Savior. And his message was, repent, you know, uh, but the kingdom of God is at hand, a reminder that Jesus was coming into the world. And so he did that. And John, just trying to obey God, he hadn't um, uh, known, uh, he said clearly, and except God had revealed to him, uh, whom was this Lamb of God, the Savior of all mankind? And the Lord revealed it to John the Baptist. He declared it to him. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, my own testimony, how that I didn't know who Jesus was uh, before I was saved. Uh, but once I learned that uh, he was the Savior of all mankind and received him as my, as my Savior, I began to declare that to others. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of uh, the world. Now in verse 35, the Bible says, Again, the next day after, John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw him following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, um, for it was about the tenth hour. Now let's go to Psalm 15. Psalm 15. We saw their request there, where dwellest thou? And they dwelt with him. Now look at Psalm 15 with me in verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell, there's that word again, in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. For he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doth these things shall never be moved. Moved from where? Abiding with him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the opportunity to look into its pages now today. We pray that your Holy Spirit would bless your word to our hearts. I pray for your help, please, and the cleansing of sin, of course, and then the fullness of the Spirit. Wisdom, Lord, to be able to declare your word in a way in which uh, the truth might be put forth and in any way that we can be used of the Spirit of God uh, to help hearts and minds receive it for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we have indicated in the reading of this text, we're focusing on these words, abide and dwell. Uh, and um, the idea there means to be and remain in the Lord's presence. Um, there are many that visit, but few abide. There are many that, um, as we saw in John chapter number 1, that stay with him for a day. But how many dwell 
in his presence continually. This psalm has always been a blessing. Matter of fact, I skimmed over aspects of it in a message uh, on January 21st, not uh, intending to preach it then. Uh, There's always been a blessing and a challenge. It reminds us of the mind and the heart for which God is looking, uh, who may enter into his presence and remain there. It means that we're talking about the idea of dwelling with God. It's real easy to get religious, as we often say. It's more difficult to walk with God moment by moment, day by day. To be in the midst of His comforting, helpful, encouraging, and leading presence. Moment by moment. And as with any other blessing that God allows us, and certainly we would, uh, if uh, rightly and biblically thought it through, we'd realize that it's a blessing and a manifestation of God's grace that we can be in His presence, that we, that we can dwell with Him and walk with Him uh, and know that uh, re- uh, relationship and fellowship as friend with friend. Uh, These, as are listed here in Psalm 15, are the ones with whom the Lord desires to fellowship. It's the ones with uh, whom He uh, enjoys time. Uh, And uh, we should be clear that uh, the Lord keeps only the best company. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Uh, And so, therefore, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Uh, We, the God of the Bible, the only uh, true and living God, is a holy God. Perfectly holy. Uh, And yet, He offers us the opportunity of a personal relationship and fulfilling fellowship with Him. Not just those two uh, characteristics, but continuing fellowship as well as we will see. It's been said, uh, as I've indicated, that God and specifically the Holy Ghost, due to His absolute holiness, is easily offended and grieved. Now, you and I get offended and grieved because we're not so perfect. God is offended because He's perfect and cannot dwell in the presence of sin. Uh, And uh, the Bible tells us in Habakkuk chapter number one, thou art, uh, speaking of God, Habakkuk said, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. And so uh, that uh, in and of itself speaks to our heart and challenges us, maybe puts some concern in our hearts. Can I know God? Can I fellowship with God? Can I Can I walk, as we have said, as in His presence? But the Word of God gives us encouragement toward that in this morning. It tells us uh, in uh, chapter 15, Psalm 15 and verse 1, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? And the description is laid out there. Now, if God wanted to keep it a secret, He had not listed these things here. But that reminds us just the fact that it's laid out for us to see and to examine our, by which to examine our life, that the God of heaven, despite our ability to understand and to comprehend, uh, he wants to save the sinner. He wants to bring us into his presence that we might enjoy him, that we might know him. But there is personal responsibility there as well as with any other uh, of the blessings of God. And so who? Who dwells in His presence? Uh, As we have said, few enter. But there are few. Amen. And the question is, not can I be in that number, but will I be in that number? It's not even, uh, again... Uh, you know, the idea that it's going to happen by accident. I can see from the Bible whom God is. And I can bring my mind and my life and heart in line with Him and then know and walk with Him. And so it comes down to this matter when we're talking about dwelling in the presence of God. 
How badly do we want to know that presence? How badly do we want to dwell there? It seems, as we have said, that there are few, if we, if we look into the Bible, it seems as there are few that are described as entering, if you will, into His presence and uh, into that, if you will, the Holy of Holies. Even John the Baptist, uh, as an example, uh, as it relates to him, uh, back in our text there in John chapter number 1, look there with me for a second if you hold your, hold your place in Psalm 15, but in John 1 and uh, down in verse number 35, and again the next day after, uh, the next day after John stood, watch, and two of his disciples. Isn't that interesting? Down in uh, verse number 37, and the two disciples heard him speak. Now, I remind you, John is out on the riverside baptizing. And uh, there are people everywhere. And two. Two. What, what was, the, um, what was uh, the measure of John's ministry? Look over in your Bible with me uh, in Matthew. Matthew kind of lays out a little bit of an indicator of maybe the scene that was there in John 1. Matthew chapter number 3, and beginning in verse 1, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye. Now, that word repent is there because of sin. Again, we said a moment ago, God so loved the world, yes, yes. But God does, loves us too much to allow us to continue in sin. So what? Repent ye. Repentance is a change of mind and heart that leads to a change of action, really. And so when you talk about repentance as being a part of coming to the Lord as Savior, you're not talking about uh, a, a personal changing of outward works. It's a realization of our wickedness, a realization of our sin, a realization of our need for a Savior that causes us to turn to Him. And uh, many of our own testimony would be that case. I know mine was, as we've said before, in a moment of time, coming out of a jailhouse, I was, all of a sudden, my life that I thought was so awesome seemed so awful. In a moment of time, I realized that I wasn't all I thought I was. And that uh, this message that this friend of mine had been given me about all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the wages of that sin is that it's true. I am a sinner. And if God doesn't help me, I cannot be helped. But of course, God did help us on Calvary. And so he preached this message, repent. Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in a wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat, his food, was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him, look at this, Jerusalem and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan. They all went out and were baptized, but two. Two. Two, at least on that occasion in John 1, heard what John said, followed his uh, leadership, and followed Jesus Christ. And those were the two that asked Jesus where dwellest thou? You see, there was an interest in a personal knowledge of the Savior. Beyond a recognition of Him as Savior, a fellowship with Him in common means, in common places. Where dwellest thou? Two. Out of all the region, out of all Jerusalem, two. This reminds us again that religion is far more prevalent than relationship with God. And uh, even here, John the Baptist uh, in verse 7, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he saith unto them, 
Oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That illustrates the very point I just made. They believed in religion. They kept all the rules. John referred to them as vipers. And uh, basically, he said in verse 8, Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. In other words, there needs to be some indication of a change in your life because of your turning to God and specifically Jesus Christ. Again, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that's what John the Baptist is saying. Before you even follow the Lord in believers' baptism here, you need to come to salvation first. And so... Uh, he delivered the message there, but few, few. Again, as a, just an example of the range, turning back to Psalm 15 with me, please, uh, the extent of John's message. We read in, uh, uh, over in the book of Acts in chapter number 9, uh, there at Ephesus, where Paul dealt with some folks that knew only the message of John. So John had a a very powerful ministry. He had a uh, he had a far-reaching impact, but two. And not only the example there of John the Baptist, but also think about Moses and um, Moses and Joshua. And um, the only two called up into the mount with God. God said the rest need to be kept back. And somebody looks at that and says, well, now that's awful. Why would God say they need to be kept back? Here's why. Because it wouldn't be too long until they'd be breaking the law God was giving and worshiping idols. God knows what's in our hearts. He knows far beyond uh, what other, uh, and what I I should say, what people see. God knows what's in our hearts. Moses and Joshua, and then it wasn't long until Aaron, uh, two men out of an entire nation, if you will, and one specifically in Moses. Then I think about also the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17. Three apostles, Peter, James, and John, were there on that occasion. And uh, Peter said himself, you talk about dwelling with God, when 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 he saw the Lord's glory, he said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let's build tabernacles. Here's what he was saying. Lord, can we stay? Huh? Can we stay and bask in this glory? Can we stay in this place of worship? Can we stay in this place of wonder? It's good for us to be here. Let's build some tents and stay a while. That ought to be the desire of our heart. In the fellowship of our God, in closeness with Him. To dwell in that presence. It is good for us to be here. And so it seems that there are few, as are indicated in the Scripture, but there are room for others. There's room for you. In the, in the continuing fellowship of a holy God. We think of Zacchaeus and the woman with the issue of blood. We think of the account of blind Bartimaeus. And in each of those three instances, the individuals went to great lengths to get into the presence of the Lord. They remind us uh, of the, um, the commitment that we must have if we so desire to dwell with Him. And so Psalm 15 is given to us as a A probing inquiry into character and conduct. It describes what's required of us if we're to enter into and remain in the presence of God. uh, In that intimate, if you will, fellowship with Him. Those who desire to rise above the fellowship of the camp into the mount of God. Where dwellest thou? Now what? Remember John's disciples. Where dwellest thou? And what was Jesus' response? Come and see. Come and see. You want to know? I'll show you. Come 
and see. And then he tells us what that means uh, as far as our uh, personage is concerned in uh, Psalm 15. Who is it? How is it? Well, this indiv- uh, so as we look at the type of individual that dwells in his uh, 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 presence, we see, first of all, in verse 2 of Psalm 15, their walk. Verse 1 says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh, what? Uprightly. He that walketh uprightly. This is a reference to uh, 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 um, the effect of our devotion for God upon our daily life. Look, when God saves an individual, he lifts them up out of a uh, a, a horrible pit. The Bible says, out of the miry clay, he stands us upon our feet and sets our feet upon a rock. Whereas before, we were just in the mire of sin. The word upright here translates the same word translated in other places as without blemish. It has the idea of blamelessly. Listen, uh, yes, we are sinners saved by grace, but we have a responsibility if we would dwell in the presence of God to walk uprightly. That's our choice. Now, before we were saved, we didn't have that choice. We, uh, we operated and lived according to the prince and power of the air. But after we're born again, we have a choice to choose uprightness over sin. And God says, this is the person that walks uprightly. Is our life upright? Is it honoring to the name Christian? Um, And unfortunately, I guess that's not even a good question to ask anymore. Because there's so many various definitions of what it means to be a Christian. And many of them in our day are, do, not, do, do not line up with God's expectation in Scripture. And so uh, this is uh, uh, the individual in whose life there's no slithering or slinking or sliding around, but somebody who walks uprightly. And we read a portion of Ezekiel 8, but if you'll turn there with me for a moment... Just by way of review, we read the Ezekiel 8 a couple, I can't even remember, recently. <laughs> Ezekiel 8, and uh, he's talking here about, uh, you remember maybe, uh, he's revealing to Ezekiel what he saw that other men, other people did not see. And we were talking about there, I think it was under Romans chapter number 2, when we were talking about when God shall bring into judgment the secrets of men. There are no secrets with God, we said. The only secrets there are are those that are with men. Because everything is naked and open unto him with whom we have to do, according to the Bible. But here in Ezekiel chapter number 8, he's looking in there and seeing idolatry and waywardness. You go down to verse number 6, watch what he said. And he said furthermore unto me, Ezekiel 8 and 6, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the, that the house of Israel committeth here, uh, that I, here it is, should go far off from my sanctuary. That's not nearness. God said, I can't dwell in that. I cannot abide that. Verse 12. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do? By the way, doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Huh? This reminds us all along the way, we better keep a short accounts with God, keep ourselves near to Him. Every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, The Lord seeth, not, uh, seeth, seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. It's a mess. God's not doing anything about it. I'm just going to live like everybody else does. Not and dwell in the presence of God, you won't. And so he speaks here to our walk. Uh, Our walk, again, being that day-to-day fellowship with God. There'll be no going up into the mount with God, dragging the world, the flesh, and the devil with us. There must be uprightness. Then 
Uh, the Bible speaks here to our walk. The Bible speaks then here to our works. In verse number two, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness. That's the outward action of what's in our heart. Um, God is watching that as well. Matter of fact, uh, if you look in Revelation chapter two and chapter number three, you'll see one of the things that God reminds the churches of there is the fact that repeatedly he says, I know thy works. Not only do I see what's in your heart, but I see what's going on. And so we're, we're moving beyond just meditating on God to where the rubber meets the road. And our work must be righteous. He that worketh righteousness. Again, connected with this work is going to be action, but certainly behind that's going to be motive. What is it that motivates us to do what we do? In Malachi chapter number one and verse six, the Lord has said, how many of you, how, how many of you go into the tabernacle for nothing? His point is there's something behind your motivation that's less than a desire for my glory. There's something in your motivation that's less than uh, devotion for me and commitment to my word. And so he called them out on it. You remember when Jesus, uh, on one occasion, when, uh, uh, when Jesus went across the sea and uh, he went across overnight and the folks woke up and they realized the boat was gone. And so they said, where'd he go? And they followed him all the way around there. And here's what they said. Where'd you go? They were looking for you. Where'd you go? Jesus didn't even answer it. He said, you're not here because of me. You're here because of the bread. You see how, you see how far a person will go for personal wants that they would never do just for the glory of God? Just by a love for him and that alone? And so the Lord said, uh, labor not for the meat that perisheth. You see, there's a whole lot of motivation we better watch out for as it relates to material gain. I want to do this because I want God to bless me. No, no. God will bless you. But we need to obey God and follow God and worship God because he's God. And the blessings come out after that. Not because we're looking for something for ourselves, And so, you may have heard recently this, this last week of a shooting out there at Joel Osteen's church in, che in Texas. What an awful thing. What a, what a poor soul that needs Jesus, or that needed Jesus. But as I watched that, Slightly less than the grieving of that loss of life that was there was the fact that this charlatan's false teaching is being promoted on national TV. It was eating my lunch. Um, uh, and uh, uh, why, why is he a charlatan? Because it's all health and wealth Christianity. Obey God for all you can get. That's the preaching of it. That's the doctrine of it. Uh, and it's unbiblical. But there's a reason why they bought a baseball stadium. Because that's a popular message with people. With people. I don't want to hear about any repentance. I don't want to hear about my sin. I just want that preacher stand up there with, with teeth the size of a Mack truck grill. And tell me that God loves me and he's going to bless me and he's going to make me rich. You understand? That caters to the flesh of men. See? It, 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 it goes straight to the motive of selfishness over the glory of God. All right. And so the Bible speaks to our walk. The Bible speaks to our work. And I'll tell you this. 
uh, you know, not just material gain, but also emotional gain. You realize we can serve God for emotional gain? What do you mean by that? Well, I've got to salve my conscience, so I better do this. Makes me feel better. Well, good, I'm glad. But in the end, we serve God again because He's God, not because we've got a guilty conscience. Not only, though, the salving of a guilty conscience, but also uh, there's much that is done uh, to get recognition. The Savior referred to it as the applause of men, the praise of men. And I'm telling you, if we're not careful, our flesh will get involved in our worship and our work for God, and we'll be clamoring for attention constantly. Well, the Lord said, if you get it here, there's none over there for you. See? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Not your own pride by wanting people to applaud you. By the way, the more you do right many times, the more you'll find out the less they will applaud you. I'm probably in trouble already this morning. But it doesn't matter. Look, uh, uh, because God is the focus, not, my, not to salve my conscience, not to get recognition. Look, there's too much look at me. Among Christians today, look at me, look at me, look at me. Let me tell you how smart I am. Let me tell you how, uh, how strong I am. Let me tell you how able I am. Let me tell you how discerning I am. Let me tell you how holy I am. And all along the way, tell you how humble I am. Brother, there's no dwelling in the presence of God with those attitudes. Because God is the one that receives glory. And so there's often too much promoting our own glory, even in our profession of God's. And we better be careful there. And so he speaks to our walk, and he speaks to our work, and then he speaks to our words there in verse number 2. Look at it in the last part of the verse. He speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. That's all speech. That's all how we talk to and how we talk about others. A couple of of, uh, sub-points on this matter of words. Uh, The private words are the meditations. Notice verse 2, truth in the heart. Again, watch it now. Because as I mentioned to our Sunday school class this morning... Uh, Some of us have been around long enough, not all of us, but some of us have been around long enough to catch our words. Because what first comes up out of our heart isn't worthy of Christian speech. We've been around long enough to catch it, but, you know, and thank God you can catch it. But the problem is, how did it generate out of that heart? That's the issue. See, we get proud of ourselves because we can control our speech. But the fact of the matter is, can we bring our heart into a state of righteousness with God? Because, uh, of course, uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Can we do that? Not just lip service uh, or to head knowledge of God's truth, but truth is in the heart. And don't you want to live that way? Purely and justly before God, like Job, he he loved righteousness and eschewed evil. That's what was in his heart. He wasn't a covering and a hiding up, or or, uh, hiding and covering up, should say. His heart. He he spoke truth in the inward part, Psalm 51. Uh, Too many, too many are not honest before God with themselves. Too, too many are like that, that Pharisee, I thank thee, Father, that I am not like other men. And even this poor publican. And it was the publican that was beaten on his breath. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Bible says the publican went away justified rather than the other. See? 
Because the other, in the other, there was this promotion of self. It is the inner life we need to be working on. There's been too much focus in our churches on the external life to the neglect of the internal. It's the very same thing that Jesus condemned in the life of the, of the, of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They, they dotted all their I's and they crossed all their T's, but their heart was far from Him. Now, it doesn't mean that there shouldn't be an awareness of our outward life. We just said that. We're supposed to walk uprightly. But it comes from a matter of the heart. It comes from a heart of devotion, not the putting on of religion. And so, the private words, the meditations of the heart, uh, which we'll touch on then, the public words. Uh, you see that there. Uh, he speaks truth, speaks truth in his heart. Verse 3, he that backbiteth not with his tongue. Now that speech has gone public right there. The word has the idea of slander and all that kind of thing. Uh, he doesn't do evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. What, is our, what, what are, I should say, our public words? The Bible says that our speech should be all way with grace and seasoned with salt. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is edifying and ministers grace. And I was reminded of Ecclesiastes 5 when it says, Keep your foot when you go in the house of God, and be not rash with thy mouth. Yes. A whole chapter of the Bible in James 3 is given to the tongue. Why? Because it's an unruly member, he says. And it's a world of iniquity, and it's set on fire of hell. Our words. And so he says, you want to dwell in the presence of God, watch your walk, watch your work, watch your word, and then watch your ways in verse 5. In whose eyes a vile, or verse 4 rather, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Notice how we move from speech to day-to-day -to -day conduct. Hey, my faith should impact the way I live. And I love it because verse 4 and 5 talk about the various aspects of life. The way I deal with people, the way I handle uh, this matter of money, the way I work in ethics, it's all kind of included here. I want to be ethical. See? The way I uh, love God will be reflected in the way I live among men. Notice, he says here that he honors the righteous. In verse 4, the word contemned is seen there. And it's really an older English word. It, it doesn't have the idea of condemn. God is the one that condemns. But it has the idea here of contempt. Uh, and it means that, uh, the, it has the idea, the sense of disrespect. And the person that dwells in the presence of God, listen, has no respect for that which is vile. Again, Job is a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil. And so we'd better let God search our heart and see if there be any wicked way in me. He speaks here uh, to, again, uh, this matter of righteousness, but then also integrity is mentioned in verse 4 and 5. And um, he doesn't put it, verse 5, he doesn't put, uh, wait, uh, last part of verse 4 especially, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. Integrity over self. Integrity over self. That's the heart in the heart of the one that dwells in the presence of God. And if we have trouble here, as I've already indicated in these things, as we've mentioned them, our walk, our works, our words, our ways, if we have trouble here, it's because we have, we're having heart trouble. We're having heart trouble before a holy God. 
in every situation of life, but especially when it comes to being welcomed into the presence of God to dwell on his holy hill with him, if you will, uh, we have to realize that while man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. What's going on in our heart? The greater idea of all of this is that one that is abiding in the presence of the Lord will of necessity be one whose life is ordered and is characterized by righteousness and genuine holiness. David understood that, of course. That filters down to the nitty-gritty areas of our life. And I'm telling you, in a world, that's, uh, in a world such as ours, at some point in the present state of this God-hating world, you and I as believers must break the mold of this age's increasingly unbiblical and unfruitless Christianity and get truly into the presence of a holy God. We've tried everything else. Every advertising scheme and promotional program Uh, We do everything but the thing. And that is dwell in God's presence. One author said this, The world is perishing for lack of the knowledge of God, and the church is famishing for want of His presence. The instant cure of most of our religious ills would be to enter the presence of Uh, of God in spiritual experience to become suddenly aware that we are in God and by faith in Christ God is in us and that would lift us out of our pitiful narrowness and cause our hearts to be enlarged in holiness and righteousness it would burn away the impurities from our lives as the bugs and the fungi were burned away by the fire on Moses' bush. I like that. Isaiah 57, 15, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is an, of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, And to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I dwell with them. Look at John 14 with me and we will close in prayer. John 14. And in conclusion we read our Savior's words as to what awaits those who seek this dwelling presence. John 14 and in verse 21. He that hath my commandments, John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. That's what Jesus said. He doesn't say you just talk about them. You're keeping them. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. Because Iscariot wouldn't be asking that. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him, watch now, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. May it be in your heart and life today. Let's stand together, please, and bow our heads for prayer.